Maybe it's that. Maybe it's that big button that says record. Huh? Um, well, we're back. Um, hi, everybody. Um, shoot. Yeah. Remind me next time. Let's start doing this from the beginning because that way we'll be able to, um, you know, in case somebody misses it, like my good friend Rudy. Um, I, would, I did want to show you something, though. You know what that is? Okay. No. Um, that's a... Uh, oh. That's a flashlight. You know how much this flashlight costs? A hundred dollars. It's not one of those readers? I thought it was those readers. <laughs> or time and light? Yeah. <laughs> that's a hell of a flashlight. For a hundred bucks, though, I can think of a bunch of other stuff that you might prioritize before this. Yeah. Buying one of these just, well, unless, I mean, because this is a spotlight, so this will shine, you know, probably a half mile if you get the conditions right. If you don't need this, why would you not go down to Harbor Freight and buy 10 other flashlights, right? Because I want to, I want to. I want to emphasize this point of not wasting money on tools because there's so much stuff to buy. There's just so much stuff to buy. And, you know, for two times as much as you spend on this flashlight, you could get yourself a heavy duty scan tool and you could be scanning cars and trucks. That's big medicine. You know, that's, that's big medicine. So, you know, let me ask you a question. The heavy duty scan tool costs twice as much as this. Do you think two of these is going to make you the money that a heavy duty scan tool can? Yeah. Uh, I can make you any money. Yeah. 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 I'd be surprised if it makes you any money because the spotlight really isn't useful for anything other than poaching. That was a joke. Just that was a joke. Friends. Yeah. It was a joke. Putting deer at night. Yeah. Poaching deer at night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So anyways, I just wanted to point out, it's very easy to spend a whole lot of money on tools. And if you're not careful, you'll waste a whole bunch of money on tools. Speaking of wasting money, it's, it's, it's the birthday boy. Hello. Happy birthday, Mr. Kaufman. Hey, happy birthday, Rudy. <laughs> happy birthday, Rudy. See? Now that's a dedicated student. He won't even stop driving. <laughs> so that's my theory about that. That's Rudy's knuckles. Yes. Um, anyways, the point I was trying to make was um, when we look at the big picture, because I, I heard some conversation about um, either changing careers. I mean, because a mid-year, I got to tell you, a midlife career change is freaking awesome. I did it. I was an auto teacher for 20 years. And then I became an electric, electric, uh, electrician teacher for like five years. But then I came to the realization, you know what? I left something I was really, 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 really good at to do something that I'm good at, but I'll never be great at. I mean, all that experience counts for something. Look, it gave, if you wanted to teach electrician, I could hook you up. They teach it at... Uh, East LA Occupational Center. In fact, that's where I met Jerry and Rudy. Um, but uh, I think they also teach electrician at Charter Oak Adult Education, don't they? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Carpenter. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They don't teach. Right. I was thinking of starting an electrician class. But I was thinking of starting an electrician class, but you know, I pretty much make all the money I can handle anyway. I mean, I don't want to be working all the time. As you can see, I'm, you know, I'm ha I've been having surgeries a lot. It's like, at my age, you don't want to be forced to work all the time. I just want know. to keep increasing my value. That's it. I just there want to you keep go. Well, get certified, value. dude. Get certified. You know, fact, I have the test preparation materials that you need because my a guy I used to work with used to have the best program in the state for test preparation for becoming a general electrician. You really need to do that. And I've got, a, a, I think, a bunch of extra sets, so. Right now I have, I just don't know if they're taking the test. Are they taking the test right now? Three, that's the thing, because of the COVID. I, it's not about the money, you know? I already have everything that I need. I just need to take the test. Right. And, just, and do a little bit of studying. Just a little bit of studying, right. that's it. And take the test. But right now, during the COVID, it's like, oh, 
and I right. messed up by not taking the test while I was working. Cause it was right. just, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's surprising how that goes. Cause the problem is when we're doing well, we tend to get complacent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then Guilty. things fall apart and Guilty. Uh, now you're in a, now you're in a bad state. So mm -hmm. I have all the ASC certifications too, because you know, it, it amuses me, but Primarily because. Sorry, I'm late. I forgot about class and I'm driving. See how you are. Yeah, we didn't forget about you, Rudy. We actually had a cake and we all blew out the candles and we all had a piece, but <laughs> we, figured you, we figured you weren't coming. Michelle made it too, so it was awesome. Um, all different identities. You're funny. I'm actually in Arizona right now. You get kicked out of California? <laughs> <laughs> nope. I'm on my way to New Mexico. Well, you certainly enjoy driving. That's good. Damn yeah, right. It's, good. it's a good thing to enjoy as much as you do it. Um, <clears throat> so, as far as, as far as certifications go, you know, I got a job that uh, that um, you know it pays a lot, and there aren't that many people that do my job, so I have to bump up my paper qualifications just so I can set myself apart from the crowd, you know, because. I mean, there's a lot of disadvantages. I mean, trying to look for a job when you're after 50 is bad. And when you're after 55, it's a million times worse. Yeah. So you guys need to get established. I'll tell you, young people, I'll tell you, young people, I had a friend that became a teacher right after she graduated college, so she was 23. She retired when she was 53 with 30 years in the district. So she's been chilling for a decade and a half. And I'm still working like a monkey, and I'm going to be working like a monkey for another 10, 15 years. So what happens when you don't commit? So uh, it's like I tell the students, you know, it's like so many of my students, it's like they're going to they're going to graduate high school. They're still not going to have a driver's license. They're they're you know, this is the this is the story I tell them. You know, my kid turns 18. I said, okay, so now what are you going to do? They say, well, you know, I'm going to think about it. I said, no, you had 18 years to think about it. Yeah. They don't like that story, but it's a good one. Um, you know, they're not going to start thinking about what they're going to do as a grown up until the day after they graduate, if then. You know, whereas you could be set up. I mean, if you went through Citrus right after you got out of high school, by the time you're 19, you could be working at CAT or you could be working at the city of Pomona or city of Rancho Cucamonga. It's like, okay, well, it's maybe not your dream job, but I'll tell you one thing you could retire when you're 50. You know? You know what's better than working at your dream job? You know what's better than working at your dream job? Being retired from any job. It was a joke. Um, but at least a good one, you know. Um, so, retirement. Being retired with a good pension from any uh, job. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, so that's my theory about that. Um, it's going to be certifications, man. Because, you know, too many people are just talking about, you know, well, I used to work there. You know, well, did I ever tell you what they call the person with the lowest passing grade in medical school? Doctor. Doctor, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. <laughs> and you know the best advice I ever got from a doctor? Michelle, you don't have to remember everything. You just got to know where to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> That's what YouTube's for, right? So, um, Heck yeah, that's awesome. so my point was that just because you say you work someplace for 15 years doesn't mean you're any good. I mean, it that's means you're, you're good enough to keep you, yeah. but it doesn't mean you're, you know, good at scan tool diagnostics or something like that. And look, folks, if you've been in the industry for 20 years and you're not at the top of the industry, people are going to start asking questions. For instance, Gabe, you know how to do industrial motor controls, PLCs? I've worked on a lot of motors, but as far as what you just said right now. Yeah. 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 They teach that class down at uh, East LA Occupational Center back where I used to work. I do, I do a lot of commercial, a lot of uh, restaurants, Lucille's oh, barbecues, you know, yeah. stuff like that. Just so. What the hell happened to Lucille's? It used to be really, really good. Last two yeah, times I went it sucked. It's because the cost. Because of everything, it's 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 not the same. It's not the same. Those people are hurting right now. Those people, the 
So was I after eating there. Yeah. <laughs> Portions suck too. It's not, it's all bad. Uh, it's, anyways, so. Actually, I just ate there and I got sick. Like seriously, I just ate there like a week ago and my belly got sick. Yeah. Uh, it's really Like spicy. the one in Rancho Cucamonga in Victoria, in Victoria yeah. Gardens. Stuff that used to be really good. Now I know. I sweet. love it. I love barbecue. Yeah. Famous, famous <laughs> Dave's is better. <laughs> mm, <think> so? <laughs> okay. Anyways, <laughs> the point I was trying to make was, yeah, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the most bang for the buck, right? Because any tool that's really super important, I'm going to have it. And, you know, you don't need to be spending, you know, 1200 bucks. Which, which do you think would be a smarter move? You know, spending 1200 bucks on this scan tool if you don't even have proper hand tools? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. So, you'd be way better off spending six hundred dollars of that on training and six hundred dollars of that on, on tools. Buy har buy Harbor Freight scan tool and spend the rest on good tools. Right. Yeah. So, now certain stuff at Harbor Freight's great. Certain stuff at Harbor Freight sucks. So, what you want to do is you want to start asking the people who know. You know, I wouldn't buy a Harbor Freight torque wrench. I mean, anything that's precision, I'm not sure Harbor Freight's the way to go for it. But then again, you know, I wouldn't spend $300 on a brand new Snap-on torque wrench. I wouldn't. I love Snap-on torque wrenches, but you can buy them all day long off of eBay. Never been used. Hey, how can you tell if a torque wrench has never been used? Let's talk about that for a second. How shiny it is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> True. Okay. Anyway, what I wanted to show you about this was Rio Hondo has the Tesla program. Now, Citrus used to prepare stuff for prepare students for Tesla. We used to have it in at Tesla, going to Tesla. But uh, the actual factory Tesla program is I want to go. Well, quit being lazy. Get down there. They also, what, all the lights? What the hell is that? I got to wait till my other hips are done. Yep, there you so go. I can actually move to do the yep. work. Okay, don't forget. Because I got all these students who are telling me, oh, well, uh, the reason I can't get a job is because I'm not 16. And then I turn 16, and it's like, well, mm, bleep, 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 bleep. It's like, oh, I thought that was your excuse for not having a job. So, Rio Hondo is a Tesla factory school. I believe they're also a Honda factory school. I think they're a Bosch factory school. Yeah, right there. So you can look into that at your leisure. Um, Tesla.com. It's even on the Tesla web page. Um, I don't know. Can you pass a drug test? That would be good. They also have an alternative fuels program. So there's all this training available to you. And it's, you know, if you don't get it outright for free because of your status, um, you know, it's going to be less than $2,000 a year for full time. That's crazy, man. You make your money back in like the first two months. You can also get your bachelor's degree in automotive from Rio Hondo. Yes, you can. I got my bachelor's degree in automotive. Look how good I turned out. I haven't got a dog done now, please. The point I was trying to make, though, was bachelor's in automotive, that puts you in management, right? So, just, I mean, all the stuff's, all the stuff's available, right? The Tesla program's been up since, what, two years, looks like? So, the head of the auto program over at Rio Hondo, me and him went to elementary school together, so we're in good shape. Um, so, what were you saying, Rudy, before I started my Tesla? Oh, 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 okay. That's what I wanted to do. Go to eBay. All right, now I'm going to go snap on half inch. Yeah, I have a quick question. I was actually considering getting a Tesla by the end of the year. What do you think about this? If I actually need it, I do actually need it. Oh, Should I get it? Why do you need a Tesla? I need a tax deduction. It's one thing. And second thing, I need something for clients. To... Okay. In a Model 3, it's the cheapest way to go. Yeah, I want a performance model model train. Okay. Because if I only buy one, so mine as well, first one. Can and I must get tax deduction, because this way I'm probably going to have to get a new one, because I need a big one. Get my 
phone number. I'll give you. I'll put my phone number or yeah, write put down it on. my number. It's yeah, put three, it on. Two, three. <laughs> Three, three, three. Second, one, second, one, second, one, second, one, second. Just one second. Yeah, let me just write it. Three, two, three. Three, three, three. All right. Three, nine, four, five. Three, nine, four, five. Gotcha. You're gonna get stalkers. Call, <laughs> call, call, call him. <laughs> call me after class, and I'll talk to you about it. All right, no problem, man. I will. Okay. Back to the lecture at hand. Hmm. I just want to point out, I would not get an electronic one. I wouldn't. Why? Because it's fancy and I don't see any advantage to it, really. Okay. Uh, it's certainly going to be way more delicate. Okay, put it this way. If you ever have to fix a snap-on tool, you're screwed. Because it's really expensive to fix. And most of your electronic stuff is not going to be lifetime warranty. So it's really expensive to fix. And I don't see the advantage in it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've been wrong before. But I would not get the electronic stuff. Besides, it's 350 bucks for, you know. Yeah, it's not necessary. Yeah. Now, this is 172 brand new. I don't believe it's brand new. I'm kind of nervous about that. Um, 200 bucks for a used one? <laughs> Oof. No, thank you. Okay, so the question is, how do you know if it's been used a lot? I would not get one of these old ones. This one's like 40 years old. <laughs> no. I sure as hell wouldn't pay almost $200 for it. I'm expecting to pay, I don't know, 120 Jeez, Chuck, you should have bought one while you had the chance. Look at this tore up piece of junk that they're selling for 170 bucks. Man, <laughs> all rusty and chewed. What in the world? See? You know, I was selling these for 110 something $100. Nobody wanted to buy mine. Okay, here's the thing. That's $66 plus $15 shipping. No case. That's no case, right? I mean, it's a precision tool, right? Which, you know, if it doesn't have a case, you got to wonder how much precision it's got. Now, snap-on stuff will hold its precision better than any other tool. But you don't know if this has, you know, been at the bottom of someone's toolbox. How you know if it's, ooh, that's cheap. 25 bucks shipping, that's why. Look at the box, right? If you look at the box, you can see that it's got greasy fingerprints on it. That means it's been used. Right. If it's got a lot of greasy fingerprints on it, that's been used a lot. Uh, or if it, the case is beat up or something like that. Speaking of which, Mr. Alvarado, are you using a torque wrench every time you make your connections? Yes, in the switch case and everything. Good. Yeah, you're required yes. by law. Okay, good. Yes. Good. Much respect. Good. Um. Yeah, without a case, I'd be kind of nervous. Gee, wizard, how is that 41 does five days out? It looks used. It looks used and old. Anyways, this lesson is going to hell because all these things are electronic. I would not get an electronic one. Um, but sound one makes nice stuff. The half inch drive is nice. That's about what I'm used to paying 100 bucks. Boy, the price has gone up. See, if you had just listened to your good friend Rowcliffe and bought one of these for a hundred bucks a year ago when I tried to sell it to you, you'd already have made 50% of your money back. <laughs> but you wouldn't listen to your pally pal <laughs> road dog. Now you must suffer, suffer in vain. Wow. Wow, this stuff's expensive now, that's cool. Yeah. All right, so here's what's going to happen. See, this used Snap-on uh, torque wrench is 280 bucks. You're going to find that you can get it new for like 170. That's better. That's better. Yeah. Um, gee, wizards, there you go. Oh, it's used and it's 500 dollars. That's nice. Why? Why? Because it's electronic. <clears throat> uh -huh. And it's flex head, and it's in good shape. And because they're hoping some sucker doesn't know how much they're worth. Because not everybody is you. There you go. Quack. Come on now. So we'll go like this. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Go back here. All right. So let's talk. We got this thing right here. Trying to get sloppy after a long day, goes like that. 
And then write down everything I write down, draw everything I draw, folks. It doesn't have to be great, it just has to be clear ish enough. All right. Well, with a connector like this, you know it's OBD2. That is 1996 and later. That's why I don't suggest getting any vehicle that's older than 96. Because OBD2 is going to give you some insanely great diagnostic power. Cannot be equaled. And this thing right here is called a scan tool. And scan tools allow us to access computers, computers and networks. The definition of networking is connecting computers. And that's what we see on all modern vehicles. Now, how many computers does it have? I don't know, depends on the vehicle. How networked is it? Well, it depends on the vehicle, depends on the year. I mean, we had primitive systems back in the early days, but now we've got these sophisticated systems where the computers are all talking to each other pretty much all the time. But now there's different computers. There's a computer for the engine, computer for the body, computer for the air conditioning, computer for the radio, computer for the brakes. So computer it all for the depends. Fuel system. Well, that's the engine computer though. But for the transmission, sure. Depending on depending on the system, right? So what the scan tool does is it allows us to access. Well, depending on the scan tool, this scan tool will access all of the computers on the car that you don't have to have dealership tools to access. This will access all the computers on the car because it'll access the whole network. These scan tools won't do the whole car. They'll only do the PCM. So let's talk about what that is. I think some of the students were so discouraged by the way the Zoom went the first night that they actually stopped coming. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. Um, cheat scan tools. Will only access the PCM. Barber Freight scan tools, whatever will only access the PCM, which is the powertrain control module. I disagree. Okay, what? Well, I can, okay, you can I, get one that'll do the ABS and you can get one that'll do the airbags. That's true. But yeah, that's because mine's a cheap one and it does ABS and airbag. Yeah, true story. Okay, thank you. Which controls? Thank you. Which controls and monitors the engine and engine sorry it's getting late system yeah i mean you can get extra added features but the 60 dollar ones are only going to do the engine um okay so the powertrain control module is going to control you know the fans the injectors the ignition 
evaporative emission systems. Um, it's going to monitor all the sensor readings that come in from all the different sensors all over the engine, all over the car. Well, all over the engine systems on the car. And it's going to test those systems. It's not going to do windows. It's not going to do the brakes. It's not going to do the air conditioning. The cheaper things are primarily there to enable you to do a power chain test. And if they got extra features, that's cool too, but they get you know, progressively more expensive depending on what more features you have. Tesla, I'm not a big Tesla guy, but if it's deductible and if it impresses your clients, well, yeah, it's a different thing. Um, yeah, that changes a lot. All right, so, because, you know, a lot of people around here are impressed by idiot stuff, right? That's why everybody's buying used Priuses, even though it's a dumb move. That's why everybody's buying used BMWs, even though that's a dumb move, because they're, you know, impressed by dumb things. So just be careful, you know. Uh, okay, so the PCM controls and monitors the engine and engine systems. And I do have a pretty good video on my YouTube channel, David Rowcliffe on electronic engine controls. You can see how fat I used to be. Um, it's a pretty good video, but we'll go through it um, this way. Okay, so what we were talking about was... Your YouTube channel's on your name? Yeah. Okay. And you can see how fat and terrible I walk. Oh, yeah, it's true. Yeah, back in the old Watts days. Yeah. Old Watts homies for Viva, right? Anyway, so my point was... <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Me and, me and Rudy have been in all the garden spots of Los Angeles. Um, uh, cancels. Okay, so... <laughs> the primary reason people are using scan tools is because they have a check engine light. So... You can call it a check engine light. Sometimes it'll say service engine soon light. Service engine soon if you got a GM. Sometimes it'll just give you a drawing of a motor. Whatever it is. OBD2, Onboard Diagnostics Generation 2, calls that at mil. Malfunction, indicator, lamp, mil. So no matter what it looks like on the dashboard, OBD2 is going to call that a mill. And if you get an OBD2 scan tool, it's going to say mill status on or off. Now, what does that mean? The PCM turns the mill, sorry, on when it finds a problem. To let you know. So the whole purpose of the malfunction indicator lamp is to let you know that there's a problem so you don't just go driving around forever. Now, like I said earlier, Suburban has some kind of coolant leak. Did it turn on the malfunction indicator lamp? Nope. No. There's a lot of problems that will not show up because the computer can't test for them. Computer doesn't do a test to see if it's losing coolant. So just because your light's out doesn't mean your life doesn't mean you're off the hook, right? 
your phone's off the hook, but you're not. But it could turn on the coolant light. Yeah, if you ran it low but enough. But you get low enough. Right. Yeah. It's primarily, it's an, it's an electronic form of testing, so it's going to find the stuff that um, electronics can find. Now, you can say that used ones need to be calibrated, but I haven't found snap-on. If, if a snap-on torque wrench doesn't look beat up, it's going to not, it's not going to need to be calibrated. And I've, I mean, they, they hold their calibration in my experience. Um, we'll find out, find out the hard, find out the easy way, find out the hard way. Let's see. It says the PCM turns on the mill when it finds a problem to let you know that there's a problem. Now there's two types of malfunction indicator lamps. Well, before I go there, do not confuse. 6407. The mill with a maintenance light. People do this a lot. Why is there a maintenance light? Well, most of these maintenance lights are there to tell you that you need to change your oil and your filter. That's why they'll usually show up at even increments like 5,000 miles, 8,000 miles, 7,500 miles. Dot oh, oh. They won't show up at 8,374.62 miles. They won't. So there's going to be two sets of lights. There's going to be maintenance required lights. There's going to be check engine lights. That's two different sets of lights. Don't get confused. One just needs one just means you need your oil changed. Okay. The tail of two mills right there. There's the solid. And there's the flashing. One is bad news. The other one is horrible news. Flashing means pull over immediately. The solid one means powertrain control module. That's the engine computer. Has identified a problem. The most common solid check engine light is caused by not tightening your gas cap all the way. I'll give you a P0456 or a P0442 because people don't put the gas cap on right or they don't tighten it all the way. It causes a diagnostic Mine still and floats. And it turns the uh, check engine light on. So if it's a solid light, it's not good, but it's not horrifying. For instance, I used to have a 98 Explorer. I guess it was a 98, I think. And when I was going up Kellogg Hill by Cal Poly, it used to turn on the check engine light. And it would give me a P0171 or a P0174 lean exhaust. Because what happened was the fuel filter was clogged. And it would start running out of fuel while I was going up the hill, you know, 80 miles an hour. But as soon as I started going down the hill, it would turn the light off because the monitors would run and it wouldn't find that problem anymore. So these lights will extinguish themselves eventually if you, if the problem disappears. Enough T cycles and enough uh, drive time. It depends. Yeah, it depends on the monitor, right? Okay, the flashing is what you got to watch out for. Flashing means over now. Now it doesn't mean shut off your car in the middle of going 70 miles an hour down the freeway. I mean, don't panic and cause a bunch of accidents, but it does mean pull over because it means imminent engine or catalytic converter 
damage risk. So for instance, if your spark plug quit working and it was just dumping raw fuel through the engine, that would give you a flashing check engine light. If your coil stopped working and it was just dumping raw fuel into the catalytic converter, that will kill the catalytic converter really quick. So since the catalytic converter and engines are really expensive, they made this so that you would know to quit driving a car. And I'm not talking about, you know, fix it this weekend. I'm talking about get it fixed. Now, this is another situation where it's important to take a class like this so you know when you need to get this car fixed this weekend and when you need to pull over right now you know, big difference, right? So um, if you got a solid light, well, take it in the mechanic sometime. Or, you know, you can just do a visual inspection yourself, see if you can see anything obvious. But it's not going to destroy your car to not deal with it right away. Okay, well, say if you have a flashing light and you don't do anything and then it just goes off one day, what's that mean? I would assume it probably means you got an intermittent inter ignition problem. Hmm, okay. That must have, you know, fixed itself. Usually, I like a loose connection, especially on an older vehicle or a vehicle that's been through a lot, a lot of mileage. The connections, the electrical connections, tend to get loose or high resistance, and then you start having all kinds of weird problems like that. Or like a vehicle, especially happens like in salvage vehicles, or stuff where they've replaced the fender because it's been in a significant accident. Or stuff flood. Like floods, yeah, Broke sure. Left. Quack. I got rid of my flood vehicles. I don't know about you. Quack. So anyways, my point was, turns out C5 Corvettes got really expensive while I, while I was turning the other direction. But my point was, so if you got a flashing light, pull over, don't drive it too far. Of course, you got AAA, right? Because you didn't, you didn't spend so much on snap-on hammers that you didn't get AAA, right? That was a joke. But that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. <laughs> You know, I would rather spend my money on a good pair of shoes than on a real expensive tool that didn't pay for itself. That's what I think. Because cheap shoes on concrete floors standing up all day will wreck your feet, wreck your legs. Yeah. It'll... I buy Red Wings and then I stop because they're gone in six months. <laughs> really? Wow. Well, red, red, red wings for me used to last me a year the most so for a long time i bought the red wings now i just buy wolverines because because you like red dawn so much that was a joke <laughs> <laughs> you big patrick swayze, swayze fan <laughs> the point i was trying to make was that um yeah so there's two types of malfunction indicator lamps now, we need to understand what happens. Hmm. Yeah, let's do this. The PCM monitors, checks, and tests. Mm -hmm engine systems electrically that's the limitation you can't, if you can't test it electrically PCM is probably not going to find it but what we've done is we've configured the vehicle so that most of the stuff can be checked electrically PCM monitors, checks, and tests basically has three ways of saying the same thing. Engine systems electrically. That's what the monitors refers to. Is It refers to the systems in place in the computer to test the systems that the computer services. That's called monitors. And I got to tell you, that I like the cheap scan tools better than the expensive ones when it comes to monitors because the cheap ones are easier to use. Okay, you got that? Like mine. 
Now, there's two types of monitors. There's continuous. And there's, uh-oh, non-continuous. Now, continuous monitor means it's running all the time. Non-continuous means it only runs sometimes. So there's a difference that you need to understand because to run continuous monitors means you're using a lot of computer power all the time to constantly be monitoring. Right? It's like it's like having a kid you have to watch all the time. Um, Non-continuous means, well, it's an important system, but it's not the kind of system where we need to be testing it all the time. So what we're going to do is we're going to lower our requirements for computing power by just testing it in certain situations or every once in a while. Continuous monitors going to be misfire because we always want to know if the engine starts to run bad. O2 sensors. Oxygen sensors. Knock sensors. Nah, fuel system. This thing called CCM. Huh. CCM, which is comprehensive. Component. monitor. So that's going to be testing your throttle position sensor and your uh, coolant temperature sensor, stuff like that. Really basic, fundamental stuff. And your map sensor. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, mass airflow, sure. Yeah. Okay, non-continuous monitors are pro primarily going to be smog devices. Non-continuous monitors are going to be evaporative emissions control. Map. Uh, exhaust gas recirculation. Um, oxygen sensor heaters. Turns out to be non-continuous. Although if your heaters don't work, it's going to cause your oxygen sensors to screw up. Catalytic converter. So just remember the continuous monitors is stuff that it needs to run pretty much. Very basic stuff, fundamental stuff. Non continuous tends to be emissions related, number one, and it tends to be stuff that we don't have to check all the time. That's the philosophy behind it because it takes a lot more computer power to check on something all the time than to check on it once in a while. And in fact, on a lot of these monitors, you're going to find that, like the EVAP monitors, you're going to find that you could drive for three or four months and never run the EVAP monitor because it might require you to drive, you know, for 10 minutes at 55 miles an hour. Well, if all I ever do with this car is drive. From here to work, that will never happen. I found that out with that 2000 Ford Mustang because I was driving it down the freeway to Orange County and the freaking light comes on. It was the EVAP monitor, which had never run because I had never gone on a long trip on the freeway before. Now, what do you know about monitors? Well, the lights on this right there, the lights on, shoot, the lights on that, there we go. There's a red one, a yellow one, and a green one. Yep. Those are monitors. Well, they're monitor indicators. So let's start this way. We're going to start with green. No. I'm going to start red. with red. And I'm going to do yellow last because it's the hardest one to understand. Green means you're good well, to go. Good. Well, monitors have run and found no 
problem. Now, here's what you need to understand, though, about this green light. Green light doesn't necessarily mean it's run all the monitors. Because in the state of California, if you're going to take your car in to get it smogged, I believe you can have one monitor not run. On older cars, I think it's two. But whatever the case, it doesn't mean all your monitors have run. But it means the important ones have. Enough of them have to pass yeah. smog. Yeah. Now, the red one means the monitors have run. and found problem. Or now, they haven't ran yet. Well, what I was about to say is, if you're running basic monitors and you're failing basic monitors, it won't run the more sophisticated stuff. It won't run the, it, it won't run the EVAP monitor if you fail the oxygen sensor test. So that's kind of what you're saying. Um, so just because it's red doesn't mean it's run all the monitors because like I said, if your oxygen sensor is bad, it won't run all it won't run the catalytic converter monitor. It'll just it'll just flag that right away. Okay, yellow means has not run uh, the monitors. Or it hasn't run enough of them. Now, here's why this is important and why yeah, I suggested you, uh, as we get into this is why I suggested you look, this is why I suggested you get the cheap scan tool. Because when people have a vehicle that has a problem, like it turns on the check engine light, what they're gonna do is they're going to come in before you get over there to buy the car, they're gonna get in with a scan tool and they're gonna race the code. Turn off the check engine light or they're going to remove the fuse that goes to the PCM, or they're going to disconnect the battery. Whatever it is, they're going to reset the vehicle so that the check engine light is out. Well, the thing is, when you do that, it's going to give you a yellow light. That's how you know. If this person says, well, I've been driving this for four, five, six months, and it has no problems, but it's got a yellow light, they're lying. They're lying. Now, this also works if you put the scan tool in and it has a red light, but the check engine light on the dash is not on. That means they've disconnected the bulb or they've removed the bulb. Because if the monitor has found a problem, it's going to turn on the malfunction indicator lamp. It's going to command it on. Let me put it that way. So if you've dis disconnected the wire or removed the bulb, that's the only way to keep that bulb from. Now, is it possible that the bulb burned out? Yeah, I've never seen it, but it's possible. Very remotely possible. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. And I've seen a lot of cars. So, when ignition is energized, you will have bulb check for two seconds. That means when you turn the key to ignition, all the bulbs in the uh, instrument panel should light up. So if you turn the key to ignition and the check engine light doesn't light up, it's because the bulb's missing. And they're doing that so they can hide a check engine light from you. I don't know if I told you guys. Hey. Pardon? That's why it's good to have the, the tool, the scan tool. That's why you gotta have a scan tool, yeah. Did I tell you guys, this is the most scandalous, it just, it just uh, never ceases to amaze me how big a dirt bags people are. No. People now have a scan tool like this that they've reprogrammed to show 
a fault when it doesn't have one, when the vehicle doesn't really have one. Oh. So right. what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, can I put my scan tool on your car just to check it out, make sure it's good? And this is your car that you know is good. It's green light all the way. Yeah. And they're going to plug in their scan tool, and their scan tool is going to say, misfire, cylinder six. So they're going to try to get the price lower. And then they're going to try to get the price lower. Yeah. Can you imagine people, like, spend their days trying to figure out how to do scandalous crap like that? Yeah, they do, too. Yeah, because if these people spent, you know, half as much brain power and effort trying to do something good with their lives, they'd be freaking millionaires, but, you know, they just want to be surplus. Oh, I'm jailbreaking phones. Oh, okay, well, yeah. why don't you get a job as a technician, man? <laughs> oh, I might have to pay taxes. Okay, welcome to my world. So, anyway, when the ignition is energized, you'll have bulb check for two seconds. You should see all those lights come on. It's a bulb check for a reason. It's there to check the bulbs. All right. Ah, sorry about that. There you go. All right. You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's off. Accessory. Run. Start. Now, there's two ways they do this. This is your key cylinder. Ah, sorry. This is your key cylinder. There's two ways to do it. They either do it off accessory run start or they do it off accessory run start. Stay on the vehicle. Sometimes you get accessory by moving the key backwards. Sometimes accessory is step one. Okay, well, the difference is run energizes engine systems. That's why if you're just going to listen to the radio, put it on accessory. Because especially on older cars, if you put it on run, it's going to energize the ignition system, which is going to get it hot. Because all that current running through the ignition system is going to get it hot. And if it's not moving, if it's not breaking the circuit every once in a while, you're going to generate a lot of heat. I squared R, right? Current, current flow. So there are cars that if you left it in run while you listen to the radio, you could burn up the ignition system or burn up the computer on the really primitive old ones. Anyway, it's just a bad idea. If you're just going to listen to the radio, put it on accessory. Um, how will you know if you're in the run position? Because all the lights in the dash will light up. Now, if you go on accessory, it will light up a couple of lights on the dash. Usually like the battery light, maybe the accessory light. But if you put it on ignition, it's going to turn on the oil light, the coolant light, the battery light, you know, all kinds of, you know, check engine light. So... Start is going to energize the starting system, so it'll crank the engine. Anyway, in order to get the scan tool to operate, all you have to do is plug it in. That's going to give you the first screen. But if you want it to access the PCM, you're going to have to turn the ignition on. That's a big problem that many people have, is that they don't turn the ignition on, and then they say, the scan tool doesn't work. Questions, comments, thoughts so far? Okay, so let's talk about this whole process. Um, when, there we go, when the PCM senses a problem, it creates what's called a pending code. Pending means waiting. So what the pending code means is I found a problem with lean exhaust, bank one, P0171. But I'm not going to go ahead and throw the, I'm not going to throw on the check engine light and I'm not going to store this code 
and I'm not going to make a big deal of it because it could just be that, you know, we drove over a bump and the loose connector made it happen. So what the computer is going to do, that's the way the old systems were, which is why everybody got used to driving around with their check engine lights on. New systems much more discreet because what the new system is going to do is it's going to wait for this problem to happen again. If the problem happens again, then it's going to say, okay, now I'm confident that there's actually a legitimate problem. That's a big deal you need to understand because when you go into the codes menu on a scan tool, it's going to say stored codes and it's going to say pending codes. You're going to be like, pending codes? What the hell is that? Pending code just means that it has sensed this problem once, but it hasn't seen it twice or whatever the number is, the magic number that they've decided they want to consider to discriminate between the two. Okay, so when the PCM senses a problem, it creates a pending code. That means it's going to sit around and wait for that to happen again. If it happens again, then we have a stored code. If it happens again, number one. Can you turn that up a little bit? Computer. Uh, the phone stores a DTC. DTC stands for Diagnostic Trouble Code. Oh. Yep. And that's going to look like this P0174, for instance. Well, the P is there to tell us that this is a powertrain code. So it's going to be engine or trans. And the four digit identifier here is going to tell us what system and what problem we found. This one is going to be lean exhaust bank two. Now, you don't need to know what a lean exhaust is yet. You don't need to know what bank two is yet. But just understand that the codes are used, well, just like the penal code, right? The codes are used, or like the diagnostic codes in medicine, they're used to discriminate between two different problems. Yeah, murder one, murder two. Different, different penal code sections. So first thing that's going to happen, if the computer senses a problem, it's going to store a pending code. It's going to say, well, OK, this, I, I found a problem, but I'm not going to make a big deal of it unless I see it again. If it sees it again, or like if it happens on the next test as well, it's going to say, OK, I think we have a legitimate problem. So what it's going to do is it's number one, it's going to store a code, and it's going to call that a stored code. Number one, stores a code. Number two, it's going to illuminate the MIL. It's going to turn on the check engine light so that you know about it. Number three, it's going to be, it's going to take a freeze frame. And you're going to see this on there, scan tool too, so I wanted you to know what it meant. A freeze frame just means that it's going to be basic engine data when the fault occurred. Like, for instance, throttle position will be, you know, 32%. Coolant temperature is 172 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Um, oxygen sensor reading was 0.458 volts. RPM was 2,872 miles per hour was 17. It's not going to give you all the data. It's going to give you a very basic data set that's going to help you in your troubleshooting. Mass airflow was 0.2 pounds per hour. Whatever. And that's to assist you in your troubleshooting so that you can tell, oh, this, this happened when I was climbing a hill. Or this happened when I went over a bump in the parking lot. Or this happened when I was first starting the car. That's useful, big time useful, important knowledge. Because otherwise, how would you know the conditions? The freeze frame is going to give you a clue as to the conditions. That's interesting. I just thought of this, Chuck. Really what it's going to do is it's going to give you the conditions of failure. So basically, this is like a blood test if you were a um, yeah, yeah, exactly. patient. Yeah. yeah. Now, when they give you a blood test, I mean, you've seen those LabCorp um, request forms. Yeah. They don't, when they give you a blood test, they don't ask for everything. No. You know, I just did two blood tests. And, you know, it's like, what do they ask for? They ask for CBC. They ask for A1C. You know, it's like they ask for a very limited number of things. Because, I mean, you could, you could do $30,000 worth of blood tests. Yeah. Well, but why would you? So they're not going to give you all the data. They're just going to give you a sampling of it. Yeah. So that's what's going to happen when you get, when the computer finds, when the PCM finds a problem, it's going to store a code. It's going to turn on the check engine light and it's going to keep a freeze frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want, you could say that it's also going to turn the monitor red, turn the monitor indicator red, but most scan tools don't even have that. So whatever. So let us discuss that in terms of scan tool. So that's what all that that's what all that information is there for. Now, if I go ahead and erase the code, which is what most people do just because they want to have this problem over with, if I go ahead and erase the code, it's going to erase the freeze frame too. And it's going to erase all the monitors I've already run. So before you erase a code, do your best to get as much of this diagnostic information as you can because it's gold. And it's going to be all be erased if you erase the code. So I wouldn't. Lots of people just want to erase the code and then they drive, you know, two blocks and the light comes back on and, you know, they just wasted a bunch of time. So don't be that person. Can I ask you a question? Um, when you it's erase good. the codes, does it erase all the codes that have been on there or just that specific one? Well, it's interesting you ask that because there's a new class of codes called permanent codes that you can't erase until the problem's been fixed. Well, that's good. Yeah, because, you know, people were getting screwy with that when it comes to the smog. Yeah. So there's a new class of codes that you can't erase unless the problem's fixed. But that's going to be all continuous monitor stuff. Um, but, yeah, it's going to erase all the codes. So if you had six different codes, what you're going to see on a bunch of these YouTube videos is they're going to disconnect the connector that goes to the mass airflow sensor, which also disconnects the intake air temperature sensor. So when they disconnect it, it's going to give them two codes. Well, when they erase that, it's going to erase both codes. Yeah. But as soon as you start the engine again, they're both going to come back. In fact, it's kind of annoying because I was watching a YouTube video with the ROP class, mm -hmm. and they, they sent this guy a free scan tool, and he didn't even know what he was talking about. I was like, damn, I got to talk to these people. Tell them what's really going on, Black. No, really, it's it's hard to know this stuff. If you don't take a class, it's hard to know this stuff because I mean, this you don't you don't learn this stuff on the streets. Yeah. This is the, this is the stuff that you know people that go to school know, which is why, just to further pursue this, people always used to give me crap about how I was a schoolboy when it came to being an automotive technician, but. I can talk to people, even 30 years ago, I was talking to these people and it became very clear that they had a very shallow understanding of stuff. Like they didn't really understand how octane worked. Yeah, they didn't really understand it. They thought they did, but they didn't really. 
And, you know, if you expect to understand this, I mean, the electronic side of this, electronic engine controls, if you expect to learn this on the street, I mean, I can talk to, you know, the people at the shops in Montclair. You got to be on this. You got to be training all the time. If you want to be on top of this, yeah. you got to be, I mean, that's hard work. Yeah. And, you know, these guys around here, they're like, oh, well, you know, they basically know, you know, what the guy behind the counter O'Reilly knows. I mean, you can look up, you can press that question mark button and say, oh, okay, well, uh, it could be this or that or I mean, I just look at the repair history of what these people are doing to these poor people's cars, and I can tell this person has no clue how to diagno diagnose a car. And you've been a mechanic 30 years, and you can't even tell if you got a fuel system or ignition system problem. And you've been a mechanic for 30 years. That's why, Gabe, I was saying it's all about certifications these days. You know, you got to demonstrate that you know something rather than just say, oh, I've been doing it a long time. I mean, I've been... I've been a I've been a father for a long time. Doesn't make me a good father, <laughs> right? Exactly. I know some people that you know their their husbands or wives, and every day they get worse. That's the first question I always asked: Are you certified? Are you certified? So I understand exactly what you're saying, you know, because immediately it's like I don't know what I'm doing, you know. It's like that's what people automatically, you know. But mm -hmm. I understand. No, you're you're right. And there's a lot of people yeah, expertise is always more important than experience. It's always better to be an expert. Well, the thing is, there's a lot of people that are certified that don't know what they're doing, right? Like, that too, exactly. Yeah, but they, it doesn't mean they're expert if they're certified. They actually need to be experts. Right. Sure, sure. I'm just saying, the way that the way that the world is going now, like Google, Google is not going to hire you based on where you graduated college from. They're going to give you tests. They want to see what you're certified in. They don't care what, you, what grade, what your GPA is. Because remember, Bill Gates didn't even graduate college, right? What's happening now is we're seeing the credentials of, oh, I went to this college, being replaced by skills test. You know, are you Microsoft Systems Engineer certified? People don't care any. People don't care anymore. I mean, the smart ones don't care anymore about because look. Once you get into Harvard, it's very hard to not graduate. It's really hard to not graduate. And people are getting into Harvard for all kinds of weird reasons. So the thing is, it's, I mean, you know what the average grade at Harvard is? A. That's the average grade. You got to work your ass off not to get an A at Harvard. So it's like once you're in, you're in. So you're in the, you're, you're in the clica, right? So who knows if you learned anything? You probably learned how to schmooze at, you know, Massachusetts bar how hopping. How much parent, money their parents gave them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, we saw that with Lori Laughlin, right? That's just sad. Okay, so you got a USC degree. What does it mean? You know, whatever. Um, so we're seeing credentialism is taken over to where, you know, people are losing their, their, they're ruining their lives by going to college. Okay, well, you know, if you get, Certified as a Microsoft systems engineer, yeah, you make big money to start with because you can't get that based on your father's connection. Right. You know, that's the thing about all these certifications. You can't get that based on your father's connections. You know, maybe maybe you can cheat or maybe your brother's an engineer and maybe he helped you get through all these okay. classes. But when it, when it comes time to take that certification exam, it's you by yourself, you know? And look, people passing a school a lot because their professors cannot fail everyone, you know. Right. Yeah, they must pass. Yeah, so I have people in my classes that really didn't know what they're doing, but they just got the grade that is passing grade. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Pay your fees and get your Bs, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you, I used to teach at Cal State LA, and what ruined it is they started doing these uh, student evaluations of, of professors. So now it's like all the professors wanted to be popular. Rather than saying, you know what, get out of my industry because you're an idiot and you suck and you're not smart enough to be what I am. Now they're all like, oh man, I sure enjoy your insights, student. You mm -hmm. know, and it wrecked it. It wrecked it. Definitely. And it's, I mean, it just keeps getting worse too because now it's like, oh, why, did, why didn't you pass me? It must be for this reason or that reason. It's like, no, because you don't understand basic principles. So, anyways, my point was. It's all about certification exams now, you know, because people can talk all they want about the ASEs, 
people used to quack all the time about, oh, well, uh, you know, I, I know this guy passed all his ACs, but he didn't know anything about cars. I'm like, you're freaking lying. There's no way. As hard as the ACs are now, there's no way you could not know something about cars. Now, you may not be very good at working on them. That's true, but you're going to know them. You know, and if you want to tell me you became a general electrician, you don't understand the NAC. I mean, people tell me, oh, yeah, I've been an electrician for 40 years. Really? How good are you at the uh, the code book? Well, blah, 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 blah. You know, okay, so you're good at wiring. Great. Okay, so have you progressed at all in the last 35 years? Code book, so, what's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, code book, what's that? Yeah. So. Ugly. Anyways. <laughs> folks, for you, for us, for me, we got to focus on discrete skills. We got to quit thinking that going to, okay, look, the thing is, you can go to Citrus College and it's a good school to have come from, but for now and in the future, I mean, that's why to get full credit at Citrus College, you have to pass all your ASEs because they want to have an independent testing body verify the grades you got. So if you're getting straight A's at a school and you can't pass a basic test of your profession, that's bad, but it happens all the time now. And you know, you're $200,000 in debt. Like for instance, you go to law school, that's why they're shutting down all these law schools. Cause so many, you know, I like the average pass rate of the bar exam in California is like 70%. Can you imagine spending three years in law school and you can't even pass the bar exam? Well, yeah, my wife, she's in law school. <laughs> yeah. well. well, she's not in law school, but in California, it's one of like six states in the U.S. that you can do get a law degree in an old-fashioned by apprenticing. Right. So you can actually apprentice for a lawyer and then just sit for the bar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so, and well. you can challenge the tests for nursing, too. Really? Yeah, you can teach yourself. <laughs> like on your dog? Or something? But I wouldn't want to do it that way, though. Yeah, but this is how Abraham Lincoln became a lawyer back then. He uh, basically yeah. apprenticed, you know, and then you basically become a lawyer. Yeah. yeah different times. Yeah. yeah, so still six times. states can different do this. Times. Yeah, I don't want a doctor that taught themselves. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do that as a nurse <laughs> either. Travels out on the dog. Um, the point like I was trying to make was, point I was trying to make was, we need to understand that that's that's where things are headed. I mean, we're gonna be we're gonna be doing a bunch of shorter classes. And it's going to be certification classes. It's not going to be working towards a degree because they're finding out that, you know, bachelor's degree, they're finding out that people with bachelor's degrees are not doing better on any skills test than people that don't have them. In fact, there's a lot of them are going backwards in terms of being able to read and write and about knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's going to be a matter of what can you do? Not where did you, where did you graduate from? I mean, I got accepted to UCLA. And I ended up going to UCR because the program was so much better. You know, UCLA was a place where social climbers went. The people I talked to, like they weren't interesting people, but they knew where to go to get their bread buttered. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, hopefully those days are coming to an end because it's just a, <laughs> it's just a way that rich people perpetuate their kids being rich. Really. I mean, can you afford to send your kids to USC? So anyways, my point was, that we look at the scan tools. <laughs> ah! And it looks like we're only gonna get part way through this lesson. So first thing you're gonna find is code, the codes menu. And it's gonna ask you if you wanna read them. And that's gonna give you, oh, sorry. That's gonna give you stored pending and permanent. You ready? Yep. Okay. It's gonna ask you if you want to race. Be very careful. Everybody always says, yeah, I want to race things. Then the problem will be gone away. No, the problem won't be gone away. It's just you won't know about it. It's going to ask you if you want to erase codes. Mm -hmm. That's the codes menu. Then it's going to ask you if you want to go to live data. And it's called live because it keeps changing. 
for instance, we have, now I have a good video on this on my YouTube channel, engine coolant temperature. That's how warm the engine is. The IAT, that's intake air temperature. Which in my car would be very hot right now. Sure. Because it's 105 outside. That's it? Yeah. And, uh, 8, 8.50 in the evening in Arizona. We've got RPM. We've got the VSS. 2,500. Rev-O. I'm not going to say Rev-O. per minute which is engine speed. That's engine temperature. That's incoming air temperature which we need in order to figure out how much fuel to use we've got vehicle speed sensor which is going to tell us vehicle speed So the cheaper scan tools are probably going to give you two pages of engine data. The more expensive scan tools can give you three, four, or five, depending on where you go in the menus. But the cheaper scan tools, the OBD2 side is only going to give you a limited amount. If you went in on the manufacturer side, which you can do with the more expensive scan tools, they'll give you pages of data crazy data to where if you tried to learn it from an expensive scan tool, you'd get lost. Incidentally, this thing says OBD2. It also says EOBD. What EOBD stands for is enhanced OBD. So it's just more sophisticated, more complicated, more generous with information. Okay, so live data. All that means, the reason they call it live data is because it keeps changing. Because if you were to plug in a scan tool and drive down the road, which you shouldn't, I mean, you should have one person looking at the scan tool and one person driving. You shouldn't try to do both at the same time. It's worse than a cell phone. You'll find out that the coolant temperature keeps changing, right? The coolant temperature goes up and then the fans turn on, the coolant temperature goes down and then the fans turn off and then, the, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be doing this all the time. Same thing with your oxygen sensor. Uh, your engine speed is going to be constantly changing. Um, there's a lot of information that you're going to get in your live data. Um, oxygen sensor is going to tell you the oxygen content. of the exhaust. Uh, if you know anybody that's thinking about joining this class, they better do it like tonight or tomorrow because I think they're going to shut down registration. This is the third week, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I think they're going to shut down the registration sometime soonish, but you could try. But that's that would be my suggestion. I mean, you can see, you know, we're pumping. We, we are doing, you know, three hours work for a three hour shift, which you can see what we've accomplished so far, and it's actually a lot more than you think. 
So live data is going to give you a whole bunch of different pages. It's going to show you the output of every oxygen sensor. Most vehicles are going to have, well, they're going to have at least two. If it's OBD2, it's going to, going to have at least two, probably four. So it's going to be a bunch of stuff like that. And the reason they call it live data is because it keeps changing. Now, like I said, the diagnostic trouble codes is going to be a numeric code that refers to a specific problem in the vehicle. So that's going to stay the same. But live data is going to keep changing. Um, 851, OK. Don't forget freeze frames. Yeah, we should do that next. Freeze frame. Well, we already talked about it, but I'll just I'll just cover it briefly. Huh? Freeze frame means engine conditions, and like I said, it's going to be a minimum data set. It's not going to be a lot. Engine conditions at time of failure, which means if you don't have any DTCs, you're not going to have a freeze frame either. Then you're going to have I am readiness. Well, I is for inspection, M is monitor. And what it's going to do is it's going to go down the list of monitors and it's going to tell you which ones have run, which ones have passed, and which ones this vehicle might not have. What else? Oh, oh, oh. It's going to give you DTC lookup. Now, when it comes to DTC lookup, I'm going to use internet. But you can use this. I mean, basically all it's going to do is it's going to tell you, okay, if you have a P0174, that's a lean exhaust tank too. Um, so it's, a, it's useful if you want to have a standalone tool. And it's going to have a little question mark thing, which usually says possible causes and fixes. So you're going to say, well, what commonly causes this problem and what commonly fixes it? You know? Useful. I mean, it's a lot of power packed in that little tool. But the key to buying Chinese diagnostic equipment, the, I mean, you realize the Klein, the Klein meters are from, are from China. That's why they're so much cheaper. Because, you know, the basic technology behind the Klein meter is 50 years old. Chinese are pretty good at doing 50-year-old technology, right? They're pretty good at making stuff that was brand new 50 years ago, like small calculators, right? They're cheap, stupid cheap. I would trust their, you know, 50 year old designs. It's the new stuff that you got to watch out for. But the 50 year old designs, I mean, it's easy. To, they're so simple. It's, it would be hard to make them bad. So that's why I have a lot of confidence. This is, this is not new technology folks. This is at least 20 years and probably closer to 30 years old. So they can do a pretty good job of making it cheap without making it junk. Yeah. The fancier the tool gets, the less likely I am to trust them. Like if I was to get a really fancy scan tool, like a $8,000 one, I wouldn't want it to be Chinese. Nah. But you know the Autel is. You know the Autel is. Autel has some limits and shortcomings that, you know, you got to ask yourself, why is this $1,200 and Snap-ons, you know, $12,000? Well, there better be some advantage to the snap-on, right? I mean, th this kind of scan tool, I'll bet you if it went bad in any significant way, you'd probably throw it away and get a different, uh, get a better one. Whereas the snap-on one, you'd probably take it in to get it repaired because you got such an investment in it. And then you'd find out how expensive it is to get snap-on repairs like BMW. 
Snap-on is the BMW of tools. Ultimate driving machine, right? So um, that's what the uh, smaller scan tools, I mean, that has the ability to connect to a computer. So you can connect to a computer. You can download updates, although I'm not sure I would. Uh, you can connect it to a printer, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of functionality that I don't really use because... You can do it on your cell phone too right now, some of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You just buy the dongles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell you what, do me a solid and remind me that that's where we'll start off next time. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, let's do that because I don't have time to cover anything new right now. Okay. Uh, questions, comments, thoughts on that, but remind me, yeah? And remind yeah, me also that. to record, yeah? Yep. Yes. Good. So we'll start, act, we'll start acting normal, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. Questions, comments, thoughts on that? Nope. Drink a lot of water. <laughs> yeah. Drink a lot of cranberry juice. That's for sure. That too. <laughs> yeah. Drink, drinking a lot of water leads to going to the bathroom a lot, which is not my favorite time of the day. Yeah, you're but, right. But it's better than the kidney stones. Yeah. Yeah, but the combination is... Anyways, my point was, by next week, I'm going to be better than okay. you. We hope so. Yeah, it's going to be a race of superheroes. So, right. um, I don't think I'm going to put this session up on YouTube. Let's see, uh, it seems like we, we started recording right in the middle of the lesson. So, But remind me, we'll start doing that. So, if you're not here or something like that, you'll have access to all this. Or if you want to see it again, or you just want to hear my voice. If you're having trouble sleeping, you can just listen to my lectures and drift right off. Alrighty. You guys didn't deny it. You're funny, old man. You guys are feeling herders. So your YouTube channel is just your name, right? Yeah, okay. That's what we can do. Let's do that right now, and I'll show you. Let's go to... Ooh, so shiny. Uh, let's go to YouTube right there. So you're going to want to go to David Rowcliffe. Uh, right there. That's my channel. Um, the video I was telling you about, about the, mm -hmm. the video I was telling you about, about the electronic engine controls is that one. But yeah, um, this has got all our Chafee Adult School Zooms forever and ever. There's a bunch of really good, there's a bunch of really good content on that. Um, and there's, you know, Chuck and Rudy in the same picture. That's a winner. Um, plus, if you want to learn how to use your drone. Um, yeah, there's a couple other David Roclos. They're just not as cool. And there's also Wrench Talk, which will show you how to use almost all the uh, big machinery in the shop. So you can get a, a advanced uh, step on that, you know, balancing brakes and doing brake, lay, brake labs and changing tires and what not. Yeah. Okay, so that is Wrench Talk. Um, that was actually done by the teacher before me. So I just stole all this stuff because that's just the kind of guy I am. <laughs> I mean, why reinvent the wheel, right? All right, folks. Well, I sure appreciate you getting here and uh, spending some time with me. Uh, I hope Thank it's you. Uh, worked out for you. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was late. Have, Have a great week. Night. Have a great week. Good night. Happy birthday, Rudy. Happy birthday, Rudy. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you. Good night.